Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Copper Hill. Great place to be on a nice, pretty winter morning, right? Especially a winter morning just made for Susan and Joanne, right? <laughs> All right, let's go to our call to worship today. Taken today from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. All right, it's really good to think about that this morning, the sovereignty of our God. Now, since it's Valentine's weekend, I always love to sing this hymn on Valentine's weekend, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Number 384, if you're in your hymnal, I invite you to stand. We'll sing the first, the second, and the last parts. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in a star, humble dwelling, of our faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, your unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, and for every trembling heart. Breathe, oh, breathe thy love in spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all inherit, let us find that second breast. Take away our pen to sin. And the faith as it's beginning Set our hearts at liberty The last verse Finish then thy good creation Pure and softness set us free Let us see thy great salvation Perfectly restored in thee, change from glory into glory. There in him we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in love and praise. O God, our Father, lover of all your created ones, we rejoice to be in your presence today through the merits of Jesus and the workings of your Holy Spirit. Please forgive us for our wanderings. And as we draw near to you this morning, may we sense you drawing near to us according to your promise. May our minds be molded in your holiness and our hearts be encouraged with your joy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In our, in our series on practical strategies for living our faith, today we're going to be talking about something very practical. We're going to be talking about money. One big reason is because Jesus talked about it and the apostles did as well. Today we're going to read a passage from St. Paul as he encouraged the Corinthian church in a gift that they were going to be giving to the church in Jerusalem. And Lori's going to come and read for us from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Lori, thank you for reading for us. I asked her at the last minute today.
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. Uh, now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genius, genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty, you might become rich. And in this matter, I'm giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year, not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their needs so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lori. And now Joanne will come and share with us Power Pack for Valentine's Sunday. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, now you can hear me? <laughs> okay, good. Great. Well, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. And it's a day we all enjoy celebrating and sharing our love with other people. So I thought I'd talk a little bit today about where Valentine's Day comes from. And you may not know that uh, Valentine or Valentinus, as he was known, was a real person. And he was a priest or possibly a bishop, stories kind of vary. Um, in the Roman Empire in the third century during the reign of Emperor Claudius II. It is believed that Valentinus was executed in the year 269. Sources say that the emperor was having difficulty recruiting soldiers because the Roman men were unwilling to leave their families. They had to serve 25 years. So um, you can see why. So um, Claudius banned all marriages and engagements. However, Valentinus defied the emperor and secretly married couples until he was apprehended and put in jail. So some say that during his imprisonment, as he was awaiting execution, he reached out to share God's love with other people. And he be befriended the jailer who became so impressed with Valentin that his, in his wisdom that he asked him to help with his daughter, Julia, with her lessons. She was blind and she needed someone to read the material for her. So he became friends with Julia and through his work with her, she came to visit him in the jail. The emperor also came to like Valen Valentinus and he offered a pardon to him to set him free if he would renounce his Christian faith and agree to worship the Roman gods. Not only did, did Valentine refuse to leave his faith, refused not to leave his faith, but he also encouraged the emperor to place his trust in Jesus Christ. Valentine's faith, choi faithful choices cost him his life. The emperor was so enraged at that that he sentenced him to die. But before he was killed, Valentine wrote a last note to encourage. Julia to stay close to Jesus and to thank her for being his friend. And he signed the note from your Valentine. So that's where we get Valentine's Day. Some say that God miraculously cured Julia of her blindness but so that she could personally read Valentine's note rather than just have someone read it to her. That note inspired people to begin writing their own love messages to people on Valentine's Day feast, February 14th, 
which is celebrated on the same day in which Valentine was martyred. And then 200 years later, the church leaders mark that as a day to honor Valentine, and they replace the Roman holiday on that date to make it a, a date to honor St. Valentine. So we remember him as someone who reached out to other people in kindness and who shared God's love with other people. So when you think about Valentine's Day, that's why it's such a, a wonderful day of love because Valentine showed his, his love, God's love to other people. Thank you, Joanne, for that little bit of church history, which helps us understand what the day is all about and why we enjoy it so much. All right, now it's time for our <clears throat> chorus for the day. We're going to sing Who You Say I Am for the third time. You're welcome to stand if you like. We usually sing a new chorus three times before we move on to sing something else. So next week we'll move on. You can stand if you'd like. Now let's go to prayer together. Then we'll play while we lift up our private requests to God in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we just feel wrapped in your arm this morning. As John says in 1 John, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Hallelujah. Praise be to God our Father, who has raised us up into heavenly places in Jesus Christ our Lord, according to the Scripture. We honor you. We honor you through Jesus Christ our Lord. We give you power and glory. We adore your loving kindness and your mercy. We praise you for your many gifts to us, for your gifts of health and strength, for your divine supply for our needs, for your eternal patience, patience with us day by day. Thank you. We admire the beauty of the days, even the beauty of the winter. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus who entered our world to teach us, to walk among us, and to give of himself for us. And we come to you in prayer this morning because of what Jesus has done for us. We could not come on our own merits. We can only come because of what he has done. Continue giving thanks for our church. Give thanks for Bible studies that have, been start, that have started up again. Give thanks for the privilege of your Holy Spirit that guides us as we learn and grow together, both on Sunday mornings and in our study groups. Thank you for the good council meeting this past Tuesday. Please guide us in the process of planning for the improvements that we need in our church. Please help us especially as we seek to invite others to follow Jesus. We want to do our part in fulfilling the great commission that Jesus gave to us. Oh Lord, we're so thankful that you brought our church through COVID with some strength. We pray that you would help us to become an even more powerful and capable congregation for your kingdom's sake. We pray for the continued recovery of those who have gone through recent surgeries. Please continue to help Carol Nielsen in her recovery. Thank you that Jim is here this morning after his surgery. Thank you for his recovery. Please grant continuing mercies to those who are traveling. We think of Judy and Ron as they are traveling. Oh Lord, our prayers go out to the country of Ukraine today in this time when war threatens. And we ask for a diplomatic solution by your grace. We pray for President Biden, Vice President Harris, and other world leaders as they seek to preserve peace. We ask for your guidance. We continue our prayers for the Methodist Church this morning during the season of clergy appointments. Please give Superintendent Reverend Alfred Sylvester and Bishop Bickerton the wisdom that they need in this annual task. And please send laborers into the harvest to, fulfill, to fill the vacancies that exist. Today, we lift up our prayers for those who are homeless, 
Those of us who enjoy the warmth and convenience of shelter in the wintertime cannot quite imagine what it means to be homeless during this season. Some are actually have no shelter. Others are sheltered temporarily somewhere, but we pray for them all, Lord, all of them who have no settled place of residence. We ask that you would provide for them and may churches like ours and nonprofits and governments cooperate to make the arrangements so that those who cannot quite take care of themselves are cared for. Please help us now as we pray for others silently by name those who struggle with grief, discouragement, broken relationships, poor choices of their own or of others. O oh Lord, may they look to you for strength and comfort and wisdom. As we whisper their names to you in our hearts, may they sense your care and rest their hearts in you. Please help us now as we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our message today is called, Put Your Money Where Your Heart Is. Everybody goes, oh no, the money Sunday. <laughs> well, years ago when Keely was in <clears throat> graduate school, when she came home for a holiday, we would love to buy her things. And we would take her clothes shopping and fix her car and give her spending money, maybe even more a little than we could afford. And at Christmas these days, Joanne has to hold me accountable or I will spend more on my little grandson than I should. You see, love opens our wallets and our pocketbooks rather easily, doesn't it? It sure does. Our giving reflects our heart. And that's really what um, Paul is saying in this passage. I forgot to get my Bible out of here. We got to get that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul's telling us that um, it's our affections that open our hearts. So as I was preparing this message, I was asking myself a question. When was the last time that my love for Jesus led me to give so generously that it was almost more than I could afford? You know, that's really a good question. He said, I am commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. Or in, in the in our SV, it was the genuineness, I believe, of your love. So Jesus is a, really our example of loving giving, isn't he? In the writing to the Ephesian church, Paul said, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So when we allow our love for God and for others to prompt us to give, we are following the example of Jesus, who gave himself for us because he loved us. So because this connection between loving and giving is so intrinsic and intuitive, Paul goes on to say in verse 8 that our giving is this test of sincerity or test of genuineness of our love. Now, at first, when we hear that, we sort of resist that conclusion. How is our gift a test of the genuineness or integrity or, or sincerity of our love? But, you know, the more we love someone, the more likely we are to give them valuable gifts, right? It's that simple. It's the same with causes that we believe in. The more we're involved in a particular charity, the more we believe in it, the greater will be our gifts to that charity in relationship to our ability to give. But the key 
is the sincerity of our willingness, or in the NRSV, the word was eagerness to give. For the Bible says here in verse 12 that acceptable gifts come from willing hearts or eager hearts. I read a joke this week about a 1950s era train conductor. His job at work six days a week was to collect tickets from those that ride the train uh, and, and from the people as they rode as they rode along. He became a Christian, and one day they assigned him to help usher at church. And he was going through the uh, pews, collect, uh, passing the collection plate as churches used to do not so long ago. And he went by a very well dressed and obviously well to do lady who passed on the plate without putting anything in. And as was his habit, the train collector, the train conductor, reached up as if to pull the cord and stop the train. And he said to the lady, ma'am, if you don't pay, you'll have to get off. Well, actually, in colonial church history, it used to be that way. Um, if any of you visit a, the colonial church in Williamsburg, Virginia, you see the little boxes where families sat. Actually, last time I visited over at Bakersville UMC, which isn't that far from us, they still have the doors on every row of pews so that there's still a little box. And in church history, in colonial area, you rented your pew. Did these have doors originally? But they had numbers, okay. This, yeah, right. Well, in, the, in colonial era, originally people paid for their pew and that was how the church was supported. But about 1860, the free Methodists came along. The free Methodists split off from the Methodist church and their reasons for existence, their big idea was that pews in churches should be free, that church seating should be free. And of course, that became the standard. That became the standard everywhere. That idea caught on. I mean, it's very biblical, right? Because the Bible teaches us that our giving should be from willing hearts, not forced or contrived in any way. And uh, actually here at Copper Hill, we follow that. We don't even uh, collect uh, pledges for our giving. Our annual budget is pretty much totally driven by the willing gifts of the people of God. Even the percentage of our budget that comes from fundraising is quite small. So this is a healthy and biblical approach to supporting the church. And it's actually one of the reasons that our church survived COVID as well as it has. I've had other pastors ask me, so how did you get your church to be dependent on tithes and offerings? Like, duh. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Because there are a lot of churches that are not. They're dependent much more on fundraising, rental income, and all that kind of stuff. And there are churches that are closing today because their financial stream is dependent on rental income, and fundraising that it no longer exists. And so they're having to sell off their buildings and, and close their churches because they're not based on the way of God uh, that Paul is talking about here, where people willingly give to support the church, which this church is. And, and I say to them, it was already when I got there, all I had to do was really encourage it and keep it going in that direction. <laughs> so praise God, that's what we've been doing, amen? And that's, a, that's the way it should be. Uh, so so uh, financial gifts to God and to others do more than express our love. Our giving also provides an accountability for our finances of some sort. Let me, let me explain. For one thing, our giving is a test of our own integrity. Appropriate giving matches our profession of faith. If we profess to love God, but we don't support his work, and we are not generous with those in need, there's a real question whether we are a follower of Christ. We are certainly not modeling after his example, are we? But when we are faithfully supporting kingdom work and giving to those in need, then it becomes obvious that such charity springs from a heart that is seeking to follow the master. Our actual giving also helps us to see whether our deeds have matched our words. Sometimes we speak well about supporting something but our bank accounts don't show the evidence that we did it. 
you know, you get those little giving statements at the end of the year from the charities that you regularly support and, and from your church. Um, this is the month you usually get those things. Well, they provide a checkup on you and me as to whether we followed through on our good intentions with those organizations. But the amount that we give is not to be measured absolutely, but rather proportionate. For Paul tells us in, in verse 12 that the giving is proportional to our income. Proportional giving means the more we have, the more we should give. Did you know, however, that research shows that actually the poorest segment of Americans give a higher percentage of their income to charity than any other income category? That's true. That is true. So um, those of us who don't earn as much, we are actually give better than those who earn more, statistically speaking, in the United States. In the Old Testament, the people of God were taught the concept of the tithes. Ten percent, the tithe belonged to God. As Leviticus says, the tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Jesus actually affirmed this practice in his discussion with the Jewish leaders. A lot of people say, well, that was the Old Testament. But Jesus met up with this in the, the practices of the scribes and the Pharisees, particularly the Pharisees, because they were strict tithers. Even as he condemned them for forgetting more important things, he also affirmed their practice of tithing. He said to them, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices. That's how fastidious they were about tithing. They gave a tenth of the mint and the dill and the cumin from their gardens. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter. That's justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And then he said, without neglecting the former. In other words, keep up your tithing, but for goodness sakes, get the important things in place. <laughs> um, so Jesus endorsed their tithing, but he, he was really worried about the important things, justice and mercy and faithfulness. So proportional giving, of which the tithe is the basic guideline, is still a blessed financial plan for the people of God. And Malachi wrote about it. The last prophet in the Old Testament said, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And often, when we get to that point, a lot of times stories tell it better than anything else. And Joanne has a couple of them for you at this time that she's going to come and tell you. Well, actually, I have a lot of stories I could tell, but I picked just two that really fit in with today. But when I, when I grew up, my parents really believed in tithing as a biblical principle. And so they always, they had limited income, but they always made sure they paid their 10% tithe. In fact, my mother believed in more than the tithe. There were missionary uh, offerings and special collections and gifts, so she actually believed in giving more than 10%. But when we were in seminary, when Calvin was at Asbury, we were on a limited income, and we kind of got behind on our tithe, but I kept track of it. So I figured, okay, next week we'll pay a little more and a little more, and we finally got caught up. So um, I remember Sunday morning, we put our tithe in, and we were all caught up. And then Sunday night, I thought, well, I'm going to get ahead on next week's tithe. So I put $2 on the offering plate. Well, the next day, in the mail, we received a check from Calvin's brother. He had sold a, an old washing machine of ours for $20. 10% <laughs> of $20 is $2. I thought I was going to get ahead of God, but I didn't. God was That was already in the mail. So you can't get ahead of God because he loves to bless us. Amen. Um, and another example is in our previous church, we were building a new addition on the church, and they asked the leadership to share with everyone how they were going to meet their three-year pledge, uh, you know, how they were going to, what things they might give up, and so on, to, to pay their, their pledge. 
and we decided that two things we were going to wait on. One was a new sofa, which we really needed because we had his grandmother's sofa. And I kid you not, it was 50 years old. <laughs> I mean, it was still True. usable, but... Mm. <laughs> And the other thing was we were, we were going to wait to get a new car. We were going to keep the one we had for a little longer. Well, don't you know that just after that, we had car problems. It, what, what happened? The car blew, a gasket. blew a gasket. So uh, we're talking some major money, you know, for, for labor as well as parts. Well, man in our church said, well, I, I work on cars, so I'm going to take a look at it. I think maybe I can fix it. And so he did. He, he fixed it. And he said, well, I'm not going to charge you for labor. I'm just going to charge you for parts. So he saved us a lot of money. Yes. And he also had a barn where he had stored some furniture, uh, some furniture that his son didn't want. And he said, you want to come and take a look? I've got a couch, actually. And we're thinking, yeah, it's probably not. Well, so we went and looked at it, you know, just to, because he'd been so good to us. Well, it was in great condition. In fact, it was a three-piece set. It was a sofa, a love seat, and a chair. It was my favorite color, purple, and it was in good shape. The only thing is, it had no legs. It sat right down on the floor. So we thought, oh, that's why he wanted to get rid of it. So we said, well, we'll take it. What are we going to do with this? So Calvin figured out a way to put legs on it, and it was fine. It was as good as new, and we still have it. Two, two out of the three. Yeah, point, two of the three pieces we still have. But when you think about it, the, the exact two things that we said we were going to wait on, a new car and a new sofa, God gave us. That's right. Now, that's no coincidence. God is just amazing. If you want to read some more of my stories, go to my website, which has a new title now, Inspired by Hope, and look for the cow story. Some of you know, but that's a great story, too. Thank you, Joanne. I think she'll be writing up some more stories for her website. Okay, one last thing for us to note. Our giving provides for the work of God. And that's what verse 14 was about. Paul wrote, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. And that, in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Now. There's a likelihood, we're not sure, but there's a likelihood that Paul's talking about two different kinds of plenty here. The Greek church was blessed with financial means. It was a trading center, uh, in the center of the Greek empire there. And it, um, the church in Jerusalem, for whom Paul was collecting the offering, was the spiritual heart of the scattered church. And they were the source of spiritual guidance and teaching for all the churches during that era. The church in Jerusalem was going through a time of economic hardship. And the gifts from the Greek churches could help the church in Jerusalem through their difficult time. The Greek church was struggling to get on its feet because of all the pagan influences in that secular city. The clear teaching coming out of the Jerusalem church from teachers like Paul was helping the Greek church to make progress. Each one was helping the other according to the gifting that God had given them. But in each case, giving was required in order for God's work to prosper. So in this passage, Paul also implied that a giving heart desires to complete what is begun. Apparently, the Corinthians had been among the first to say that they would support the offering for the church in Jerusalem. Excuse me. <coughs> but they had not yet made good on their word. So their giving to this offering, which Paul was promoting, would help them to bring to completion the good intentions that they had expressed. And the same is often true for us. We say that we desire our church to prosper. We say that we want to help, and we acknowledge that God has blessed us. But we have put, but have we put all those things together and completed the equation by giving appropriately to the work of God and that God is doing in our church? Paul counts on their willingness and ultimately. He, has, he was correct because they gave generously to the Jerusalem church. Paul knew that a willing heart sees the need and responds to the need. And that's what it was about there in uh, verse uh, 14 and 15. <clears throat> he said, at the, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. 
so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Excuse me. <coughs> so the same has been true of our church all during COVID and continues to be true. Praise be to God. Willing givers continue to support our church. And we praise God for the way he is blessing our church and pray for that to continue. And we give thanks for faithful financial giving and look forward to its continuing. Is a part of the overall vision to create a stronger and more capable Copper Hill Church. Our church leadership has invited us to begin to step up in the area of pastoral support so that we are ready when Pastor Calvin eventually retires, someday that might happen, that our, that our church will be listed as, as a, uh, I know, but people like Mary are praying that it doesn't happen for a long time yet. <clears throat> oh, well, as long as the Lord keeps giving me help, right? <clears throat> well, anyway, what we're trying to do is be ready when I eventually do retire to be listed as a three-quarter time church with the United Methodist Church rather than the one-quarter time church that we were listed at, if I remember correctly, when I arrived. So that's a great step up. This will require an increase in our budget for the coming year. And as you know, Copper Hill Church has risen to the challenge of several such increases in recent years past. And we are confident that by the grace of God, the response of willing givers, and the good planning of our financial team, we'll be able to meet the challenge again. So further details are available monthly at our council meetings or from our financial chair, Lori, who read to you today. So my conclusion is this. This week was Joanne's birthday. and As a part of my gifts to her, I bought her some flowers and arranged them for the table. And they were one of my expressions of love for my wife on her birthday. So as we close the message today, I would like us each to think of our gifts to God and to others as bouquets of flowers given. They are love gifts to God and they express our heart of love. Amen. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh okay. After 17 years driving this car, it died. And no one could find everybody. I took it to, every, you know, mechanics and all that, and nobody could find what the problem was. So anyway, a friend of Zach, my grandson, Jenna's husband, um, Joe, his name is, and he acquired this Jeep. And so he and Zach talked, and they had fixed it up, and if I wanted it, it was mine. So, of course, I took it because I was bumming rides from people or staying home or whatever. <laughs> that was in May. And in December, and at this time, the Jeep had no heat. Anyway, so uh, my son-in-law's mom was moving to a, a place. She, her husband had passed, and she was moving. And then she had this car in her garage and she and her two boys decided that i should have it and that's what i'm driving and it does have heat god is good i'm telling you amen all the time <laughs> praise god for his yes. divine supply yes. awesome praise the lord for the way he supplies our needs right yes. hey thank you for that word of testimony god is good Amen. Awesome. Well, our hymn after uh, the message is number 593. 593. I invite you to stand. This is not a hymn we sing often, but it's a beautiful hymn. The Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, 
my hand will say, I who made the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? How will I say? <clears throat> announcements for today first of all next council meeting is wait a minute that was last week we did have council meeting this last week and in our meeting we discussed uh, plans for adding a nursery to our church so talk to your council members and see the different things that were under discussion there 
And we also decided that we would put together some of the things, the ideas that we've been discussing into a new vision plan. So we'll be doing more with that in the days to come as well. Atheist scholar Gerd Luderman criticized Christianity for its supernatural claims. But even he admits that there is one event in the Bible that needs to be true for Christianity to mean anything at all. You know what that event is? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, exactly. Three women who arrived at the tomb first said it was empty, but Jewish law did not allow women to give testimony in a court of law. How do we know that some of the disciples didn't steal the body? If someone asks you, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? What would you say? These are questions that we need to know the answers to in order to defend our faith. So if you're not quite sure how you would answer those questions, then we would love to have you come to Bible study this week because we are talking about that very thing. How do we know for sure that Jesus rose from the dead? From Josh McDowell's book, The Unshakable Truth, chapter eight. So even if you haven't- Truth eight. Uh, Yes, The Unshakable Truth. Right. Um, it's even, truth eight, not chapter eight. Okay. Yeah, that's what <laughs> Got I said. That? Got it. Uh, well, even, there's four chapters per truth. Okay. But it's in our study book, it's chapter eight. Oh, yes. You're right. That's right. I got you. Anyway, even if you have not joined any of the studies yet, even if you don't have a book, you can join us either here in the church in person or on Zoom online. And you have your choice of three different days. So we would love to have you join us this week. That's right. And we'll be back on our regular schedule this week for Bible studies, Tuesday at 6.30 here at church and on Zoom, Thursday at 1 o'clock at Higby Village, and Saturday at 1.15 on Zoom with Joanne. Coming dates, we have our next confirmation class is scheduled for February 27th. So, and we'd like to thank Lisa, who is helping out with the crafts and the snacks, and also Judy, who's helping with the snacks. And Joanne. And me. Well, I like to make cookies. What can I say? <laughs> Lucky me. And then Ash Wednesday is coming up on March, March 2nd. We will be having an Ash Wednesday service. Also, don't forget, we have Bible charts on the piano for you to check off the chapters that you're reading, reading your Bible each day. We'd really like to encourage every one of you, no matter what your age, to be reading God's word every day. Right. And if you're doing it on your phone, I've been getting into uh, apps with the view version that you read a book at a time. There's, I've discovered there's a, a number of them. So I've read several books of the Bible already with view version uh, apps. He's way ahead of me now. It's in Leviticus. No, you finished Leviticus. Right? Yeah, and two or three others as well. Okay, thank you for your continuing giving to Copper Hill Church. Did I just lost the mic here. No, I didn't lose it. I just lost the box. Um, technical difficulties. Technical difficulties, <laughs> yeah. Your volunteer work and your financial giving continue to work together to make our church possible. I thank God for all of you whose hearts are in this ministry and who contribute both time and money to make it happen. When you give financially, you can give through our website at www.copperhillchurch.us by using the donate button there, or you can text your gift to 860-579-6338, or you can mail your gift to box 422 East Granby, Connecticut 06026, or you can drop your envelope in the giving box at the rear of the church. However you do it, thank you for your continuing generosity in each of these varied ways. Let's ask God's blessing upon our gifts for today. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, you have set your love in our hearts. And out of that love for you and for others, we willingly give back to help your kingdom's work. Thank you for each one who has done that today or this week. May they be prospered by you as you see fit. Please use these gifts to strengthen your church and meet the needs of others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat>
Now I invite you to pray our clothing, closing prayer together with me. Our Heavenly Father, enable us by your grace to love you with our whole heart and our neighbors as ourselves. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. I'll be waiting to greet you for a couple more weeks. And Joanne will be greeting online. <clears throat>